if he enjoys this. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he doesn't enjoy it. But how do you know? The experiment may express joy in a different way from us. Yeah, he might like it. Stop it. Stop it. It's your problem. This is as good as it gets. It can't be. It has to be something else. Doesn't there? Now, why don't you experiment on each other? So, would you be keen? You're not to touch me. Only now, at the end, do we understand. Or do we? Episode 6 is arguably the most insane episode of the new series because it gives us a ton of new information. I'm not here to make too many lore assumptions. My intentions lie in less literal and more open-ended interpretations of what the show might mean. So without further ado, let's complete the set and see if we can find any hidden details in the final episode of DHMIS Season 2, Electricity. If you're a first time viewer, this is the last video in a DHMIS series. I'll put the playlist link in the description and pinned comment so you can find the rest of them if you want to check them out. Immediately we can tell something's off from the opening. Instead of the catchy theme song, we watch as a gloved hand cranks a handle like a jack-in-the-box waiting to explode. The world we have known is about to come crashing down. Prepare yourselves, my friends. This gets Nuts. The events of the last episode seem to be a half-forgotten memory, or perhaps the episodes don't actually follow a traditional chronological order. Either way, everything is normal now, and the episode starts just like any other. There are two new important objects in the kitchen, an electric box and a paper shredder. Yellow showcases his usual clumsiness, and the other guys showcase their typical callous manner of treating Yellow when he gets stuff wrong. I've been in Yellow's position many times before, and I think that it's important to notice this dynamic because later in the episode, this dynamic changes. Duck is working on a crossword puzzle. It's when you can't remember that over the top of you, there's bigger ones that are bigger and bigger than over the top of it, there's a smaller one with all of it on top of that. Ah, okay, just excuse me while I have a stroke. Duck asks if anyone wants anything shredded and Red pulls out an electric bill. With the exception of the episode Jobs, none of these characters have been seen going to work or making money, and the bill is for a little over 19 pounds, which tells me there is real world currency in the show. But the biggest twist of all is the company that owns the electricity, Roy Electric. Dun dun dun! Could this explain why Roy is following them around everywhere? All this time was he nothing more than a debt collector? And Yellow's dad, of course. I'm not sure, but I do have questions about how they were paying the bills this entire time. Do they have jobs? Or has someone else been covering for them? A bill? Who cares? We won't be paying that! Electricity is silly stuff that ought to be free! I once again wonder who Duck was fighting in the war and what exactly he was fighting for. As the gang sits around trying to decide what to do with the bill, the electric box on the wall starts to shake as something or someone tries to get out like a xenomorph through a chest cavity. It's this odd little robotic fellow named Electracy who's here to teach them about electric things. Like chairs. Duck's Shredder song gives me the will that I need to try to keep living this life. And the noises Duck makes after singing his song give me the strength I need to kill myself. Yes, yes. And, and the Shredder, yep. <laughs> I cannot believe how wrong I was. Don't worry, Duck, we're used to it by now. Electracy tells them not to worry. Soon everything in their home will be plugged in and part of the electric family. And now we see once again that the motives of the teachers do not align with those of our main colorful cast of creeps. Because Electracy's plan is only gonna make their bill even higher. Like every teacher on the show, she only has self-interest in mind, and this lays the foundation for Yellow's transformation later in the episode. Wait, hang on. I thought you had to be plugged in to be electric. You're not plugged in, lying daughter of a bastard. Electracy explains that she still uses electricity, she just runs on batteries. Technically a battery is a device that stores chemical energy and converts it to electric energy, which means at no point would she be plugged into anything, but we don't have time for petty details right now because Yellow tells us that he runs on batteries too. The D on his shirt stood for Duracell all along. The others express shock and indignation. Their friend have batteries? No, 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 no. You don't seem like the type to have batteries. You're just stupid. Hint, hint, I'm fairly certain that this particular plot point isn't actually about batteries. But sure enough, he does indeed have batteries. And not just any batteries, but batteries that look like the kind you see in devices that have been long dead and stored in an attic somewhere until they start leaking acid. When was the last time you changed those? 
friend. When was the last time you said something that wasn't condescending, Electracy? Whenever I want. Gosh. Duck aggressively rips out the poor robot's batteries and switches them with yellows, which completely changes the game from here on out. Electracy getting her batteries changed to the nearly dead ones is one of the most terrifying concepts in this entire series. She was a seemingly sentient being with a level of awareness and freedom that suddenly ripped away from her, and her apparent brain fog makes it impossible for her to communicate or even fully comprehend what happened to her. Let that sink in, because the same type of thing happens again later. But at least Electracy has cheeky snakes for hands. Gotta love British humor. Hello, governor, you got any cheeky snakes for hands? Mate, bloody bloke. Spot a tea. On the other hand, Yellow becomes an unstoppable force of intelligence with the potential to change the universe. He even creates a fun spatial distribution-based puzzle. Yay! And we see that his eyes change to their true color, green. And as you all know, green is not a creative color. And the tariff is a special playlist you make for your electricity. How about you shut up, Electracy? You don't know what you're talking about. This episode actually changed my perception about every one of the main cast, as Yellow is suddenly able to perform basic everyday functions without being clumsy, and even seems more knowledgeable than his counterparts. And what do you think Red and Duck's response to this is? Something like, oh, Yellow, we support you, and this change is great. You're independent and capable now, and we can all contribute equally. Yeah, that'd be a great response. Too bad they actually decide to get incredibly offended by his newfound freedom and clear-headedness. As it turns out, Yellow's friends actually kind of enjoyed being super mean to him and bossing him around all the time. And now that he's able to see through them, they have immediately begun preying on his downfall. Now for all I know, this is a one-off thing just for this episode, and it doesn't really last too long, but it was kind of shocking to me to see how little they valued their friend as a person. He was apparently just their emotional punching bag all along. Kind of makes me sick. I digress though, let's continue. Duck starts to imply the world has gone insane. The world has gone insane and parasites are eating at my brain and nothing is the way it was before. A pack of wolves is howling at my door. They just turn up and tell us what to think. Where did it even come from? No, it's you who's gone wrong. Duck goes on to say that Yellow isn't supposed to say things like that. In other words, he's not supposed to say that kind of stuff. But Yellow's right. Why do they live in a strange world inhabited by wildly misleading teachers? Where did everything come from? Yellow is on the hero's journey, and he thinks he's seeking God. But in reality, he's just searching for himself. Crucify the ego and all that, very young. Yellow has the brilliant epiphany that maybe just maybe, his friends have been bossing him around for far too long. He sees an ominous, dire, forbidding, and sinister looking flight of stairs. Sometimes too many perfect adjectives fit, okay? And just like Pokemon and my references, you gotta catch them all. However, something evil shifts and moves new events into motion, trying multiple times to distract Yellow from the stairs. The mirror turns into a teacher and starts lecturing. But he turns away and starts up the flight of stairs of his own volition. This is important. In the background, Red and Duck are talking about a creature that turned into Duck, probably Stain Edwards the Forever Boy, and Red says the word experiments. Foreshadowing. As they do so, we realize that they don't even note Yellow's absence. As he ascends the steps, we see this strange painting of him on the wall, ascending the steps. What could this mean? Has this all happened before? Notice the staircase has a slightly blurry, scratched up bit right here. This could either be the world of puppets and color ending as he enters a strange new part of the house, or it could be the handrail being worn away because this has happened so many times already. This episode is the only episode without the signature intro song, and the mid-episode break has been tampered with as well. While much of the show up to this point made meta references, here we are truly breaking the fourth wall and starting to learn more about the universe and world that these characters inhabit. This is where you go to learn where babies come from. When Yellow sees the background puppeteers controlling the rock teacher, who obviously was just talking about how Tony Iommi's signature style set the stage for metal for decades to come, we can see the word Clay Hill on the chalkboard, only it's been scratched out. I love that the big boys are just stoner intellectuals with inflated egos and very little to say. I wonder how I can identify such things. Ha, ha, ha. Just kidding, children. Drugs are bad. 
Okay. This shot reminded me of Jack Stauber's undisputed masterpiece, Opal, for some reason. Once again, Jack and DHMIS would be like the greatest collaboration of all time. We need to see that happen. It'd be so cool. Duck has diabetes and the clock says 2006. Could this just mean 8 p.m. or could it have something to do with 2006, seeing as the date is right next to it? I have no idea. Red and Duck killed their cat. And this is proof that Red and Duck represent curiosity. Now all they need to do is bring him back. Oh, they already did that by making a robot cat? Awesome. Now that's what I call ethical. See, it's gone plaid now. Had you noticed that? It had gone plaid now. We have gone plaid. Yay. Yellow guy goes into a bigger boy's room and finds Walt and Jesse making meth. In this reality, the guys turn into cold-hearted scientists playing God with- Oh my Triscuits! Created by Cthulhu himself to try and figure out what humans like to eat and is only consumed by masochists! Is that Stain Edwards the Forever Boy? I insist on saying his full name. It's kind of all I do now, since I already wasted the gimmick of calling them all by weird names that aren't their real names. He kind of looks like that creature from Rick and Morty when Rick tries to kill himself. Yellow suggests that they experiment on each other, proving what the ancient fanfiction foretold. Meanwhile, Duck and Red manage to get the power shut off. They're just lovely, responsible people, aren't they? You know, at this rate, I don't think either of them qualify to be called the dad. Okay, before we get to all the stuff that's actually going on here, because there's a ton, I first just want to say that I think this is like one of the coolest sequences in all of DHMIS. The piano, the room, Leslie's design, all the poems and mysterious beating around the bush talk, it's beautiful. This also might not be the final floor of the house, as it seems there are still higher doors Yellow hasn't gotten to yet. More on that later. Up next, we've got this thin rectangle. Can you guess where that goes? That's right, it goes in the square hole. And up next, a cylinder. Hmm, I think that goes in the square hole. There's the bag of chuddy Ds, the bloody shovel, and the batteries. Who are you? <laughs> Look how strange she gets when she says that. Who are you? My name's Leslie. It's nice to meet you. Near one side of the house says no, and the other says no. Which is my daily exchange with my brain. Learn more things! No. Yellow asks her some questions and she just laughs at him. Very helpful. There's a bunch of fun references to the older episodes as characters are found dead. Like the talking steak from my nightmares and waking hallucinations. Kind of hidden in the background, you can even see Roy. Letting us know once and for all that whatever role he may have had to play, he is no longer in charge of everything. Something I find interesting is that the characters end up dead when the power goes out. How many of them were potentially robots then? Or could this be implying that there's something else hiding in the dark that is killing them? Maybe Leslie has destroyed them? Who knows? When Leslie is messing with dolls of the main cast, the duck's figurine falls over and the head pops off. An homage to the events of the death episode. She just waves it off and says she has tons of replacements. This shows us how expendable she really sees the cast as. Leslie can reincarnate characters using puppets. Cool. Now I'm just confused. All of the symbols and runes found throughout the series show up on an ancient tome Leslie gives Yellow. She screams at Yellow, you're not my real son. And we finally understand the truth. Matt Pat was right all along, apparently. Just kidding. But seriously, what seems to be implied from this and the dream sequence in episode 5 is that she lost her real son in a car accident and created a fake robot son in a world of felt and clay to mold to her idea of an ideal childhood. She tried to trap him in a world where he's always ignorant, always under her control, and always a child. However, this is just an idea, and there's a lot of extrapolation involved. And I know this is kind of a cop-out, but seriously, take everything that I say with a huge heaping spoonful of salt. I only have a very small grasp of what I'm talking about. And a lot of these concepts were thought up by community members who are a lot more knowledgeable than I am. Think for yourself, question stuff, look into things, all that jazz. Anyways. Hey, current Daniel here. Notice that yellow guy wasn't on the picture of the stairs until he starts going up the stairs. I literally just noticed this while editing and wanted to throw it in the mix of information, so yeah. 
Anyways, carry on past Daniel. On the book, we can see symbols relating to the untimely demises of the central characters this season, plus Tony the Clock's head. Yellow takes the book as Leslie manipulates him into going back to his so-called friends who immediately call him selfish and greedy and rip the batteries out of his chest. Before he leaves, we can see a flight of stairs going up higher that he missed. This makes me so angry, but also happy because it means maybe there'll be more content in the future. And so begins one of the most disturbing and heartbreaking pieces of media to come out of 2022. Yellow is stuck, standing there, holding the book that has all the answers, but he has lost the ability to even comprehend what he holds in his felt hands. So he does what anyone would, and shreds it in Duck's shredder, willingly, but partially unknowingly, bringing about his own slow, unescapable demise. The overbearing aura of malicious intent that permeates every single episode of this show is exponentially increased as we realize Leslie was manipulating him and tricking him into doing this all along. She gave him the keys to escape, knowing full well that he would destroy the key. Although there was considerably less intensely bloody or overtly horror-based sequences in the entire new season when compared to the original show on YouTube, this was almost scarier and more hard-hitting. The main characters are all starting to lose their sanity, and they stop trying to escape as the show goes on. The desperation turns to resignation and even denial, and multiple times characters are on the verge of a breakthrough only to have it wrested from them to emphasize their lack of control. The characters have their curiosity punished and stamped out of them and become scared of disobedience. They find comfort in the routine they once abhorred and right as they found a way to understand what was going on, finally, actively work to destroy it, and as the camera slowly pulls back, they laugh. As Leslie told them to, they see the funny side now, and it's incredibly sad. But thankfully it just leaves room for us potentially getting another season of the show. I also really hope that there's a legal worldwide release soon, because, you know, British people aren't real. Like, y'all can colonize over a hundred countries, but you can't get distribution rights outside of the UK? Seriously? I kid. It's entirely possible that even if the characters did manage to escape, they would just be replaced again. They aren't dead, and they will never be dead, because they can't die. In every single episode of Season 2, we're shown that no matter how much they suffer, they will always end up back where they began. Their eternal hell of pain, suffering, and confusion can never, ever come to a conclusion. Or so we think. So, what happens now? I've made over 2,000 videos on a bunch of different channels over the course of five years, and the response to these last few videos I've made have given me power and it filled me with determination. So thanks for watching. I have more ideas for DHMIS content, I could do something with the original series or try to come up with more theories, and I have a bunch of other things I'm currently fixated on that I want to make videos about as well, and I hope that you'll join me. If you like my style of videos, check out my other stuff. I think you'll like it. I'm also trying to hit 20,000 subscribers by the end of the year, so, you know, if you want, you can do that. Right down there. You know you want to. And make sure you tune in next week when we will be uncovering the secrets of the mastermind that was behind everything in this season of DHMIS. And no, it wasn't Roy. No, it wasn't Leslie. It was this fucking toilet. And the curtains were on fire. Fuck, I'm sorry you feel all alone with the TV blasting shadows on my face. Hitching back to the apartment. It was such a lonely place. I place my head between my knees and think do you ever have nights like these so separated from my sense of self and the shit you keep up on your bookshelf